Lesson 2.3, populism and the election of 1896. Make sure you remember this election. The only other two elections you're going to know. It's the most important except for Lincoln in 1860. Don't forget 1876. Big stuff. There's a few presidential elections. You know a snap chart there for you on the left-hand side for your central question. Impact on politics. It's big. It's long-lasting. Not a lot happening immediately, but the ideas are introduced and there is enough to create a third party to challenge the existing parties. Have a hard time remembering some of the ideas in here and who's about what? Well, maybe check out uh, The Wizard of Oz uh, and a book that was written in this time period. A little allegory at the end in your left hand side, matching up characters in the film to people, issues, things in the time period. Uh, check that out there at the end. You can look it up and match those things up, I think, pretty well. A little Minnesota here for you. Dorothy, known as Judy Garland in real life. Birthplace, Grand Rapids, Grand Rapids, Minnesota. Check out her hometown if you get a chance to go up to northern Minnesota. So you've got something in your movie bucket list and your travels bucket list. So the election of 1896 really brings about three choices for people, and that People's Party is the third one. The impact of third parties in American politics isn't huge in most of our history, but there are a few. This is probably the, one of the most important and significant of all American history here with the populist movement and pressuring those two main parties to make some changes. One of them will concede, as we will see in a second. But as we talked about before, there's economic stress throughout this last half of the 19th century that is creating a lot of these economic stirrings, political movements, third political parties, the populist party becomes the top one, but there's also a lot of labor uh, labor union organization here and big national ones, and that will be for another unit. But this is not just a rural farmer thing, it is in the industrial centers in bigger cities of the north and east, and the farmers are going to try to get their ear and get them to vote for them, as we'll see. A couple of elections we're going to cover here, just to kind of fill in the gap a little bit. The election of 1880 saw a guy by the Republican James Garfield elected. He was assassinated almost immediately by an unhappy job seeker. This is the time when if you helped somebody win political office, you were rewarded with a job, even if you didn't know how to, do, how to do anything related to that job. It was called the spoil system. It goes back to Andrew Jackson. And so this brings about another piece of federal reform. Uh, on top of the previous one, the Interstate Commerce Commission Act that we talked about before, a little less laissez-faire than we had before. Uh -oh, this is involving uh, civil service reform and actually having some sort of qualifications for a job. We'll talk about that more a little bit later. Uh, Republican Chester Arthur takes over, uh, and he's probably our least known president. The election of 1880 also was spurred by a movement of lean back party candidates uh, winning positions in Congress. Uh, the Blue Green movement, the populist bottom-up movement, uh, is being seen through that party as well. Uh, and they had nominated that guy, the name of General James E. Weaver, to be their person. Of course, he's going to become a populist representative for that populist party here in the upcoming election as well. The 1884 presidential election, a guy that should be easy to remember, Democrat Grover Cleveland wins a very close election. Right? And he was all about civil service reform as well. He wanted even more rules and regulations for how you got a federal government job. It wasn't, shouldn't be just about who you know. So the common people saw that as an attack on corruption, and they liked that. Right? He also argued for a lower tariff. It was pretty high. It was accumulating a huge amount of excess money sitting around in the federal treasury. And people said that's not what it was supposed to do. It was supposed to protect and promote uh, the growth of industry, and it's too high, and it's just creating extra money, and so that's bad for consumers. And to remember, Democrats down with that. That's something he won on. He serves out his four, ter uh, four years in office in 1888. A guy named of Republican William Henry Harrison wins and defeats Grover Cleveland's second attempt and second run for a term in office. Right? But he's going to come back, Mr. Grover Cleveland. The 1890s do see a little bit of compromise between the two sides in terms of this money issue. And the money issue, the gold-silver currency issue, is the most important issue here of the 1890s, and it's the issue of the 1896 election, but it was building up all the way through. Uh, in 1890, there was a compromise between both sides uh, of the world and the political spectrum in that they established more of a system of bimetallism. They doubled the amount of silver purchased under the bland Allison Act that was uh, passed in the 1870s, which increased the money supply and 
help hopefully bring about some inflation. So our farmers are happy with that, right? And they start printing out these things called silver certificates, a paper dollar that basically could be exchanged for silver in hand, all right? The farmers, the Westerners, kind of agreed to support a protective tariff in exchange for Eastern support of this particular thing, right? On the other side of it, the Republicans reward for that Democratic support of the Silver Service, uh, Silver, Sherman Silver's Purchase Act, uh, is a higher tariff. And it's that tariff that is the highest in peacetime history, 48% on goods coming into the country. And so this wouldn't be so great for consumers. You can really add that again. We've talked about that before. Uh, and this also put a lot of pressure on people who are working in factories, right? Uh, there you see a businessman pointing to a sign there, you know, if that tariff goes lower, that's gonna possibly result in your wages being reduced or maybe even your job being lost because I'm gonna have more competition for foreign goods and foreign businesses. Right? And I will be able to compete. So make sure you vote Republican. Keep that in mind. Vote Republican. And so this is going to be a lot of pressure on those industrial workers not to vote Democrat. And with William Jennings Bryan, this we'll see coming up in the caucus later on. Where do I go? What do I do? Right? Common person of the Northeast person and common person of the West, will they join together here? Another piece of compromise here and a little bit of action against the powers that be. All right, is the Sherman Antitrust Act being passed. It's the very first federal law regulating monopolies in our nation's history. It's still around today, and it is going to be applied in what is recently announced just a handful of days ago, not even a handful of days ago, a antitrust lawsuit against Google. They have a monopoly. Listen for that in the news. But it comes out of a lot of public demand for regulation of especially railroads, railroad trusts, holding people hostage because they have a monopoly on an entire business three big individuals there and big industries there. There are a lot more of them out there than just these uh, who have uh, monopolies as well. They're going to be attacked by this. It's still on the books today, uh, and it's going to try to break up monopolies so it maintains competition. What we saw is what we're seeing in this particular time period is that there's so much freedom and there are so few rules in the economic game that a very few powerful, wealthy individuals are controlling everything and they're gobbling up, they're killing off the competition, and that's bad for the consumer, right? So that's the gist of what's behind this legislation. This cartoon is a famous cartoon that comes out in that debate over the Sherman Antitrust Act. It's called the Bosses of the Senate uh, in 1889, just before that, and it portrays how these big trusts are literally in the back pockets of uh, the senators at the state and federal level notice how these senators are looking back at these trusts these trusts being portrayed as big money bags gigantic large in size they have a direct route into the united states senate floor and the people's entrance is closed they don't hear the people's voice they hear the voice of the trusts and the money that influences their votes its weakness is that it ironically is going to be used by big business industry trusts to break up and weaken labor units and to stop strikes, really. And they'll argue in courts that strikes are illegal because they monopolize a part of the economic system, and that is labor. Labor unions, by going on strike, are monopolizing their labor. Therefore, strikes are illegal. Can't do it. So unions have really no power here at this point in time. Other than what they get vi quite violent, they do have a lot of power and they do disrupt things. But when they're violent, they look like radical crazies. Look at this cartoon, excellent portrayal of the entire time period, the last half of the 1950s into the 20th century, excuse me, 18, 1800s uh, and, and into the 20th century. Um, uh, the People's Party at the center, it's a balloon, it's a balloon with holes in it. The Farmers Alliance is right next to them, the Silver Party in green right next to them, the Greenback Party right next to them, kind of in the center, right? And around them and associated with that balloon, uh, making the, up the fabric of that balloon are the socialists and the communists, right? The other organizations, it's a platform of lunacy, right? It's craziness what they're proposing. Uh, there are anarchists associated with them. Uh, they want this silver ratio, 16 ounces of silver to one ounce of gold, free coinage, free money, unlimited greenbacks, control of government controlled railroads, the telegraph. The women's rights movement is in there, right? It's a challenge across the board and a, of, of, of the entire system here that this party is, is, is connected to. And so uh, our populists were an attack on that laissez-faire system and a creator of 
or a seen as going to be a greater big government and uh, a concentration of power in government, right? So it's a, kind of a fight against one concentration of power, monopolies, versus the fear of the creation of another concentration of power, right, in all of this, right? Great portrayal of things. Oh, and by the way, banning of alcohol, right? Prohibition Party. All these things are going on at the same time, and labor unions tied in there as well. They're challenging and complaining because of the economic stress and the unjustness of the democratic system that has been corrupted by the business in the office. Our 1892 presidential election brings about this guy, Grover Cleveland, again, he's the only president to run twice and win in two separate non-consecutive terms. Uh, the People's Party is in there as well in that election, as we've seen before. James D. Weaver is uh, the former Greenback Party candidate. He will win as a pop populist candidate, the first populist candidate in 1892. And there are many other populists who win congressional seats. Almost a million popular votes are won by that party in this particular election. Of course, they will review what you should have read. They want free unlimited coinage of silver. This is not in your notes, but you have it already. Uh, they want to have that to stimulate inflation. Uh, and to counteract the economic stress of the time period, right? We've got panics in 1873 and 1893. They barely get out of one and they get into another. Uh, they want a graduated national income tax. It's the time when there are some state taxes, but there's no federal tax. Whatever these big business and industries make, they keep uh, government ownership of railroad and telegraphs. Railroads, we saw direct elections of senators, right? That gets back to here. Uh, and with our senators at the U.S. Congress level, at the federal level, those senators are chosen by state legislatures, and those state legislatures were seen as being corrupted and controlled by the big trust. So the trust actually controlled who became a United States senator, rolling on ahead back to where we were before. All right, so our 1892 election sees some success. Electoral votes won by the populist party here, but Grover Cleveland does win. Again, the only Democratic president from 1865 to 1908 and serving two non-consecutive terms. As soon as he gets into and is sworn into his second term in office, there is the Panic of 1893, only 10 days later. Railroads going bankrupt, banks going bankrupt, businesses going bankrupt, 20% of unemployment that rivaled the Great Depression of the 1930s that's going to come. People called out for relief. But the government continued its policies. It's just part of nature. We just got to wait it out. We can't mess with the economic system too much, right? Laissez-faire, all that kind of thing. And it happens because of over-speculation. Loans that were given out to farmers too much. Uh, they went more into debt. Uh, the reduction, there was a reduction of the money supply, largely, uh, at the time, uh, after the Purchase Act before. Uh, labor strikes. Across the country, agricultural depression pretty much was the rule, as you can see through since uh, the 1870s into the 1890s. Uh, poor prices for uh, farm prices and consumer prices at that point in time, right? And so it was seen as, as a war on wealth or between the classes. And this is a picture of depicting a bank being rushed by people to get their money out before the bank closed because it would run out of money, get it out before it fails. The United States government was in stress at this time also. They were running out of money. They were going to go broke. It was going to collapse. Who pay its bills? The workers, uh, the army. Imagine that. And so Grover Cleveland cuts a deal with mega banker J.P. Morgan, J.P. Morgan Chase today. Um, you'll hear more about him a little bit later. The uh, deal is that Morgan, at a very nice rate, would finance, bail out the United States government. And the public was absolutely livid at this because this was seen as a deal with the devil, with the monopolies, the powers that be, more corruption, controlled by one big money person. Cleveland also repealed the Sherman Anti uh, Sherman Silver Purchase Act as well, which shrunk the money supply, and that, of course, made the Depression worse. This isn't your notes either, but people marched on Washington, D.C., and in particular this guy, Leo Coxie from uh, 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 Pennsylvania with guns in hand, some 500 individuals marched to Washington, D.C. saying, the government needs to create some jobs, some public works jobs. This is that the Great Depression, the New Deal. Increase the money supply, right? Uh, they were arrested uh, because they were supposedly walking on the grass or on the Capitol building and that kind of thing, public rounds. I think it was probably more because they had guns, but perhaps not, who knows. 
Uh, but th that's the kind of intensity that is here. There were groups of people marching in protest in Washington, D.C. And again, the 1890s, it's not just about the farmers. There are strikes, violent strikes across the entire country. And some of these strikes are put down by the president and the military uh, because they are seen as a disruption to things. They're going to shut down production, for example. And in 1894, with that panic happening, a shutdown of production and disruption of the economy was going to make the economy worse. Uh, but in particular, the Pullman Railroad car strike, in this particular case, uh, was uh, uh, put down because it was seen as being interfering with the United States mail. And all the mail went around and moved around on railroads. And so for that reason, President Cleveland brings in federal troops. This will be the theme pretty much for most of our history up until through the 1920s, until 1930, where the courts pass injunctions or will the say that these strikes have to stop. And so all of this creates more animosity and anger toward the government. They don't care about the common person. This is going to also cause Mr. Grover Cleveland to lose his next kicked out of office, or not be nominated again for office, right? But well, he's going to seek some another term in office, even though he's got a second one going here. This is the cool cartoon and picture here. Notice the background, the palm trees, palm trees, populist party, connected to the old Ocala demands, Ocala, Florida, yes, palm trees, the origins, kind of in a rural countryside setting. The 1894 election returns, the midterm election here, results in, because of economic stress, populists getting even more votes and basically swallowing up Democrats, right? And Democrats largely being connected with rural farmers and so on and so forth. The common man, the populist party, is basically taking over their seats in Congress. And so the Democratic Party is under pressure here to change or die, be swallowed up by the great constrictor who is represented here by William Jennings Bryan, the candidate for that presidential ticket coming up in 1896, right? And so the election of 1896 has these two individuals, William McKinley for the Republicans, represented by the gold standard on the left, gold coin, and William James Bryan on the right, known as the great commoner. And these two individuals will butt heads about what is best for the country. And William Jennings Bryan, even though he is a populist, we'll see that he's going to become a Democrat. And the Democratic Party will survive, but they're going to change their tune and their messaging. The Republican platform was, we're going to keep the gold standard, but they support some bimetallism, right? And if you notice the cartoon here, they're okay with some silver, but it's got to be controlled. Silver coin is in the back of the bike. The lead, the most important, is the coin that is in the front of the bike, even though it maybe looks smaller there, it says 100 cents on the front, it's the steering, it's the direction, the silver coin has 65 cents on the back, whatever those numbers mean, it does portray the message that gold is still going to be it. They want to control the money supply, as we talked about before. Keep focus on the tariff, keep it there to protect industry, right? Remember Republicans raised famous little pins that the Republicans would wear in this election, gold pins. If you were a gold bug, you can see McKinley's face there, that's the pin you wore, right? And the Democratic platform, of course, is on the opposite of it. We reviewed some of it as well already. Uh, the Democrats refused to endorse Cleveland again. There was no amendment limiting him to running another election, a term in office, because of his previous dealings with the corrupt, the corrupt uh, monopoly that was behind J.P. Morgan. Uh, and uh, the populists basically are pushing for him to run as a populist candidate. But Brian has a tough choice now here. The Democrats want him to be the nominee for their party as well. And so as a rational person, he says, well, the party that's been around the most and has the most resources, the Democrats, I'll run for the Democrats, but I'm going to run on populist ideas. So he becomes a Democrat, but he's running on populist ideas. The populists endorse him. And this is going to be the first major politician to lead a major party campaign as a champion of the poor person. That's the first campaign where that is seen in the messaging and the ideas behind it, right? Good versus evil, as we talked about before. It's an agrarian revolt, a common person, revolt, tariff reductions, graduated income tax, restriction control of big business, especially railroads, 
free coinage of silver if you were a Democrat, James Bryant uh, supporter, you were a silver bug. Notice right there, 16 to 1, right? More silver, 16 ounces for every ounce of gold. Huge voice. One of his biggest uh, speeches was known as the Cross of Gold speech. You're going to read it. Make sure you understand it. This cartoon kind of satirizes and criticizes him for what he says here, but basically he says, you shall, you, big business, federal government, Republican Party, shall not press down upon man, uh, upon the brow of labor, workers, the common person, a crown of thorns, right? Uh, you shall not crucify mankind on a cross of gold, right? That's his famous speech. And in this, basically, he is is saying that uh, the uh, Republican Party in a pro-gold policy is oppressive to common people, right? And so what does he do to get his messaging across? Well, he had this booming voice. He could speak to thousands of people, and they would hear him for a huge distance. He had immense amounts of energy. Great orator and speaker from the state of Nebraska out in the West. Uh, and he basically literally goes on what's considered to be the first modern campaign. He gets on a train, he utilizes technology, and he travels 18,000 miles in that campaign, speaking town after town after town about the messaging of the populist party, but it's really you know, the Democratic Party platform now at this point in time. If you were a Democrat in 1890, it's super important to remember, understand, you're a Southerner, you're a farmer, uh, you're a Westerner, probably more likely than not. You support low tariffs. You want other countries to buy your crops. You'd even like a tariff on agricultural goods, which there wasn't. Republicans were intended to be more Northerners, right? Northern industrialists, uh, workers uh, were pressured to vote Republican. You were a Southern, Af Southern African American, right? A freedman, right? The, the party of Lincoln freed you, so you support Republicans and support high tariffs, right? Make sure you understand that 1890s results. It's a fairly close election, right? Democratic blue throughout the South and the West, right? Also, which means populist South there as well. Republican in the North, Republicans in the North. And so it is a victory for urban America versus rural America, industry over agriculture, gold over silver, East versus West. Think of it kind of in those terms, right? And that theme has been here in American history for a long time. You could probably say that that theme is pretty similar in any history throughout human history uh, that you would, you would read about. Uh, so it's a conservative victory. The Republican Party is going to dominate for the next 16 years. Banking industry, big business is what it's going to be all about. Uh, big cities in the Northeast, this is a time period with the Industrial Revolution really raging and roaring. There is a huge amount of immigration, which is another topic for us in the upcoming unit. Uh, but there's a kind of a big sadness and a decline in voter turnout here where they Common people, rural people, feel like there's no chance for them to have any say or make any change in politics. Uh, that uh, there is uh, uh, no, a lost vote here. My vote is wasted and not heard, and heard here in, in presidential elections. And that's going to last for a little while. Uh, until, since the Civil War up until that point in time, voting turnout was huge. Right? And so uh, he's really the last uh, presidential candidate who's going to try to win with farm, rural America, rural America votes. Um, he's going to uh, uh, not get the votes of that northern eastern part of the country, the common industrial worker there, because they're going to get pressured by uh, their industrial employers. Uh, the economy improves. This is the reason why they fail as well. Gold is discovered in Alaska in 1896, so the supply of gold creeps up, increasing the money supply uh, north to Alaska. Uh, the era of small producers and small farmers was starting to fade away and were becoming more industrialized than ever before. And, and again, the issue of race is still pretty strong there. It divided the party. The party in the South wasn't quite in tune, as, as in tune uh, with things uh, as it was in the West and the North in rural America. The uh, African-American vote wasn't uh, included in there as much as they would like to see that have seen it being included uh, because uh, of the divisions in the South. Uh, they're not able to break existing party loyalties, as I mentioned before, uh, in the North, where industrial workers pressured to vote for Republicans. Uh, Northern Eastern votes were really the key in all that. Had to break down the red wall, today we call it the blue wall, if you're correct, 
And so all these are some factors why it declined. Uh, most of their agenda, again, is adopted by that Democratic Party. And so they were swallowed up. But the ideas aren't, aren't gone, right? The ideas are still there. It's just under the new party name. And so most of what gets proposed here, it doesn't happen, but it's very soon with more economic stress and another movement, a populist movement is the one we're in now. We're going to move to the progressive movement, which is right on the heels of this one. Actually, they connect up and they overlap. Uh, it'll, it'll eventually happen, everything that you've seen in the overall romance of populist party platforms. Our election of 1900 was a rematch of the same two individuals. McKinley wins a close election again. Uh, your left side is your chart. Make sure you go through your documents on the left-hand side there as well. Your second essential question is essentially there. Read a little bit more about Mary Elizabeth Meese. Uh, it's important to understand in these reform movements, women are increasingly politically involved in a part of these movements, union movements, third political parties, and reform issues like prohibition, and of course, women's rights, the right to vote is strong here at this time. It's going to get a lot stronger. William Jennings Bryant, his oldest cross of gold speech, I think it's in the nomination in 1896. Read that and pull some words in there that it's up words and phrases and ideas in it that get people to support the Populist Party widely popular. Little timeline information for you in there as well. And if you're interested, check out the your bucket list, the film, The Wizard of Oz, those monkeys in that film scared the heck out of me. Oh, by the way, in the book. Dorothy's shoes were silver, not ruby red. Right. So match it up, check it out. Have a good day. Make the hay. Good day.